Hello and welcome back to Machine Learning. I'm Javita Christi and today we are going to see what is machine learning. So in the last video, I talked about what human learning uh, was and in this video, we are going to talk about what machine learning is. If you have uh, missed the previous video, you can uh, find it linked down below. So first of all, let us uh, go through some fundamental questions that we have about machine learning. So if you do not know anything about machine learning, you know, what kind of kinds of questions do you have? So the first question obviously is, can machines really learn? And if they really learn, then how do they learn? And which problem can we consider as a well-posed learning problem? What are the important features that are required to well define a learning problem. So these are some of the fundamental questions that come to mind when uh, somebody tells you uh, the words machine learning and you don't, don't know anything about that. Now let's uh, start by, you know, we are going to answer these questions eventually, um, but let's start um, by giving a formal definition to machine learning. And this definition is given by Tom Mitchell, Professor of Machine Learning Department, School of Computer Science in Carnegie Mellon University. So he says, a computer program is set to learn from experience E with respect to some class of tasks T and performance measure P if its performance at tasks T um, as measured by P improves with experience E. So uh, I know it's a lot of uh, E, T and P, but if you just look at the definition all it's trying to say is that um, with experience um, the computer program is able to do better uh, at those tasks given so just like human beings with experience we are able to do our tasks better uh, more efficiently and that's the same way so there are three things here experience tasks and performance so initially because there is no experience uh, the performance of the program uh, while doing those tasks is not so good. But then when experience is involved, then the performance um, increases, it becomes better. So that is what machine learning is about. Your performance increases with experience. And this essentially means that a machine can be considered to learn if it is able to gather experience by doing a certain task and improve its performance in doing the similar tasks in future. When we talk about past experience, it means past data related to the task. Obviously, it is not uh, the kind of experience that human beings have. It is uh, a computer program, so it works with uh, data. So based on previous data, um, you can find out how exactly the experience helped in solving future problems. And this data is an input to the machine from some source. So the data is obtained by the mas machine from some source. In the context of the learning to play checkers, okay, uh, so if you, in case you don't know, checkers is a, is a game, um, a board game where, where, you know, you have several pieces on the board and you have to get all the pieces from um one side of the board to the opposite side so in that type of a game and of course there are um there are small boxes on the board that you can you know uh use and you can jump over the pieces of um uh, of the other players so now if if that type of a game is their game of checkers then e represents the, the experience of playing the game t would represent the task of playing checkers and p is the performance measure indicated by the percentage of games won by the player. Okay, so I suppose in this context, um, E, T, and P are quite clear, okay. And the same mapping can be applied for other any other machine learning problem, for example, image classification problem. So if you have to classify images that, you know, if somebody is giving you images of uh, fruits as well as vegetables and, um, um, you want your program to tell, you know, this is a fruit, this is a vegetable. 
then um, in that uh, as well, experience would be how many times um, this program has previously classified uh, fruits and vegetable okay, images. And here the task would be to classify the images and the performance can be checked by seeing if the classification done by the program was correct or not. So in context of image classification, E represents the past data with images having labels or assigned classes. For example, whether the image of a class uh, is of a class cat or a class dog or a class elephant, etc. T would be assigning the task of assigning these classes, um, unlabeled images, and P is the performance measure indicated by the percentage of images directly classified. So it's just as I explained before. Now, how exactly do machines learn? We, we are coming back to that question now. And it is uh, basically in this manner, you have input data, you have abstraction, and you have generalization. Now, in this video, we are going to talk about these things, uh, not, um, not uh, you know, very deeply. We are going to talk about, um, you know, more about these uh, phases in the next video but here you'll get a brief overview of how that happens and we'll try to draw an analogy between how humans learn and how machines learn so this is uh, the basic machine learning process divided into three parts there is data abstraction and generalization So the first thing is data input, which means past data or information uh, that can be utilized for future decision making. So this is like um, if you want to predict um, sales um, profit for your company in the next uh, next year, then you might want to give as an input to your computer program uh, sales data from all the previous years as much as you have. So that would be data input. Second is abstraction. So the input data is represented in a broader way through the underlying algorithm. And uh, you'll soon see that there are many machine learning algorithms that you can apply. And the third is generalization. So the abstracted representation is generalized to form a framework of making for making decisions. So you have to generalize the representation because um, you are uh, you are going to use that data which you had previously. You're going to use that data to uh, predict what the future holds. So let's put all these things into perspective uh, of the human learning process and try to understand the machine learning process more clearly. So we are trying to um, draw an analogy between human learning and machine learning. So let's consider the situation of a typical process of learning from classroom and books and preparing for the exam. OK, so it is a tendency of many students to try and memorize, which is often called learn by heart as many things as possible. Right. And oftentimes um, we can't help it. We, there are a lot of things that we have to learn. For example, um, when you were in school and you were taught multiplication, it, it is compulsory to uh, memorize um, multiplication tables from 1 to 10 if you don't know that much. OK, then um, you won't be able to do any multiplication at all. So sometimes you cannot help but memorize. But sometimes um, we do not want to do anything other than memorizing. So it's um, either way, students do memorize. Sometimes they have to memorize a lot of things. And this may work well when the scope of learning is not so vast. Also, the kinds of questions which are asked in the examination are pretty much simple and straightforward. So if somebody is just um, simply going to ask you very, very simple questions about not multiplication tables, but, you know, um, maybe someone's going to ask you what is the definition of machine learning, then whatever you've learned from the videos is enough if you just memorize that you'll know the definition but if somebody asks you to you know actually explain that definition and you have not um, read anything about it and you don't know what some of the terms mean then you won't be able to explain it 
So the questions can be answered by simply writing the same things which have been memorized. So when you have straightforward, simple questions, uh, you just recall from memory what you have studied and you can just answer the questions. But as the scope gets broader and the questions asked in the examinations get more complex, the strategy of memorizing definitely does not work well. So the number of topics may get too vast for a student to memorize and the capability of memorizing varies from student to student. So there are people who are, you have a photographic memory and they can memorize a lot of things, but there are some people who are not good at it. And uh, so there are two problems. One is that you have memorized a lot of things, but the questions now are coming, uh, which are complex and not straightforward, where you actually have to apply um, what you memorized instead of just writing what you memorized. So that's one problem. Second problem is um, you cannot really memorize everything. It's not possible for any human being to be able to memorize everything. So that capability or capacity is also a problem. Together with that, since the questions get more complex, a direct reproduction of the things memorized may not help. And the situation continues to get worse as the student graduates to higher classes, because as you go to higher classes, uh, it's more about application than about memory, right? Initially, it's about memory because you have to learn A, B, C, D, and you have to learn um, your numbers and all that because um, you have to memorize spellings and all initially. Without that, you cannot uh, proceed to apply those things. So initially, it's like that, but then as you go to higher classes, people expect you to, um, to actually apply those things. So what we see in the case of human learning is that just by great memorizing and perfect recall, that is just based on knowledge input, students can do well in examinations only till a certain stage. Beyond that, a better learning strategy needs to be adapted, adopted. And that strategy is this. Number one, you have to be able to deal with the vastness of the subject matter and the related issues in memorizing it. And the second strategy is to be able to answer questions where a direct answer has not been learned. So you have to develop this ability where whatever you have memorized, you should be able to apply somewhere. A good option is to figure out the key points or ideas amongst a vast pool of knowledge. And this would help you in creating, you know, if you if you create outlines of topics, uh, create a conceptual mapping in your head, um, if you try to do such things, you know, instead of memorizing um, the whole chapter, if you could create an outline of the chapter and try to just remember those uh, points which you have outlined, and that could help you to actually recall everything about the chapter. So, for example, a broad pool of knowledge may consist of all living animals and their characteristics, right? There are many animals and they have many characteristics. Uh, they have all different characteristics and uh, they, they could be living in water or on land. They could be laying eggs. They could have scales or fur or none, etc. OK. So it is a difficult task for any student to memorize the characteristics of all living animals, right? No matter how much photographic memory he or she may possess. It's not possible for you to learn about each and every animal. So a better way is to draw a notion about the basic groups that all living animals belong to and the characteristics which define each of the basic groups. Okay, Those basic groups of animals are invertebrates and vertebrates. So essentially, vertebrates are all animals that, are, that have a spinal cord, a, a vertebra, and uh, invertebrates are animals without that. So like animals that can crawl like a snake. Okay. And then you can further group vertebrates into groups like mammals, animals who give birth to, um, to other animals, uh, reptiles, amphibians, fish, uh, fishes and birds. Okay, so you can ca uh, categorize vertebrates into this. Okay. So here there is, there's an example of how you can map uh, animal groups using their salient characteristics. 
So the first one is invertebrate, which do not have backbones and skeletons like snakes and um, worms and all. And then you have vertebrates. So the vertebrate animals, they are like fishes that live underwater. They lay eggs. Amphibians, semi-aquatic, uh, okay, they, they can live on water as well as land. They have smooth skin. They also lay eggs. And reptiles are semi-aquatic like amphibians, but they have a scaly skin. They lay eggs and they are cold-blooded. Okay. And then there are birds that can fly. They can also lay eggs and they are warm-blooded. Uh, mammals have hair or fur on their body and uh, they can they have milk to feed their young ones and they are also they are warm blooded so now uh, now that i have these groups available to me uh, if somebody asks um, what what kind of category or what are the characteristics of a frog then i just have to find out which of these groups the frog belongs to. So it's quite clear that the frog does have a structure. So he, it's a vertebrate and an amphibian because frogs can live in water and land as well. And not a reptile because no scaly skin, right? So based on that, you can understand, you can, you can find out that frog is an amphibian. And um, so you can, uh, you can tell that this is, uh, these are the characteristics of frogs, right? They, they live on water or land, they are smooth skinned and they lay eggs. So moving to machine learning paradigm now from, from this vast pool of knowledge that's available, which is data input, what happens next? Okay, rather than using this in entirety, a concept map much in line with the animal group to characteristic mapping explained earlier is drawn from the input data. So this is exactly what a computer program or a machine does to learn. It tries to create a, an outline out of everything that you have provided. So you might have provided, you know, uh, things about different animals, uh, characteristics, and the machine is going to group them together and find some fixed set of rules that can help it to understand um, or to categorize more animals in future. So this is nothing but knowledge abstraction as performed by the machine. So this is abstraction, right? Uh, we often learn in object-oriented programming that you know when you're performing abstraction, you're trying to hide data. And that's essentially what the machine is doing. It's trying to um, hide the complex characteristics under one group. And in the end, the abstracted mapping from the input data can be applied to make critical conclusions. So for example, if the group of an animal is given, understanding of the characteristics can be automatically made. So if somebody just tells you that frog is an amphibian, uh, it's very easy for you now to uh, list out all the characteristics of a frog. And reversely, if the characteristic of an unknown animal is given, a definite conclusion can be made about the, the animal group it belongs to. So uh, say you do not know that frog is an amphibian, but if you saw a frog, Right, you could list out the characteristics of the frog and you could find that, okay, this one belongs to the amphibian group because of all these characteristics. So it works both the ways. And this is generalization in context of machine learning. So there is abstraction and there is generalization. And we're going to see more about these things in the next video. So I'll see you there and thank you for watching.